So good. All right. Welcome to Lancefield on the Line. My name is David Lancefield, and I couldn't be happier to be with Michael Bungay-Stania, MBS, as you'll know more widely. Welcome <laughs> to the show. Uh, David, thank you for having me. I uh, really appreciate you reaching out. I know you've read this new book of mine, and I'm excited to have somebody who is, I think, as enthusiastic about this book as you might be. So this is going to be great for me. Indeed. I have a fragile male ego, so your job is to stroke it and make me feel good about myself. <laughs> I'll do my best. I might challenge you a bit as well, but hey, I've read it and used it more important, even more importantly, right? So um, yeah. you need little introduction, so I'll keep this brief. You've written six books, selling well, well over a million copies. This is the book you just referred to, yeah. How to Begin. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, you, Thanks. It, it's excited me, uh, challenged me, stimulated me. It's succinct funny, substantive. Uh, and it's a book that candidly, when I, when I get off my but, 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 I will write a book that not is the same as this, but it's a book that I would love to write. So I, I take my hat off. It's very compliment. difficult to get those combinations. And, you know, we're going to talk today about the central mantra of the book, which is about unlocking greatness by working on the hard things. Yes. And of course, worthy goals. Goals that are <laughs> That's right. thrilling, important and daunting words and adjectives I could probably describe for how I'm feeling right now but let's <laughs> I guess guess say there is an urgency yeah. about you I sense we don't know each other but I hope we do yeah. going forward there's an urgency in the book I mean it starts <laughs> it starts on the front cover um, right. tell me about that where does the urgency come from in you I don't know actually it's a really interesting question to ask um I just interviewed a guy called Arthur Brooks who um, has a new book out called strength to strength and he writing about purpose in, in, in the second half of life. And his purpose comes from his faith. He's a devout Catholic and he has a, a sense of the work I do is in service to that and right. you know, the greater good and a life in heaven after that. I'm an atheist <laughs> and I'm an existentialist. And like existentialists, like, you know, it's like you don't have inherent purpose. So where's this coming from? But um, I, there is some seed in me, whether this is just a quirk of wiring or where it comes from, I'm not sure, around wanting to have impact and wanting to be of service. So mm. um, 20 years ago, um, I was part of a, a men's group, actually, uh, something called the Mankind Project, and um, had a chance to kind of revisit purpose and mission and vision because these things often do kind of like, do you know what it is for you? Yeah. And the language I had for me was to infect a billion people with the possibility virus, which I appreciate sounds much better when there's not a pandemic <laughs> raging <laughs> for three years. But nevertheless, um, this idea of a possibility virus for me is helping people have the courage to make the braver choice, to see the yes. choice and to make the braver choice. And that's just had a real resonance for me. So I keep coming to moments where I'm like, if I'm trying to do that, what's the project I should be working on to try and, and get that done? That's brilliant. There's a determination in the book. Um, so you know, when you go through one step, it's hard to stop. And I actually started doing it. And today's not about me, um, so I won't go through it. But I've been struggling with my own worthy goals, combining yeah. professional and personal commitments. But there's a determination to it. And I guess ultimately you use the term, you know, living a, a life well lived as a sort of concept, right? And just... Tell me about that. Yeah. Not necessarily just about yourself, although you do share your story in the two challenges around the podcast and handing yeah. over responsibility um, for your CEO role. But what does that concept mean in the context of the book? Well, you know, one of my all-time favorite movies, and I, I'm so glad to actually be able to mention this in, in the early pages of the book, is um, a book, a movie called Strictly Borum by an Australian yes. director called Baz Luhrmann. Mm. And he's gone on to create book movies that are better known than that but i love this it's about the intrigue of ballroom dancing in rural australia <laughs> it's great it's a classic hero's journey and uh and a duckling into a swan journey i mean it's it's wonderful and um our heroine fran uh who's who's kind of a bit drab when we first meet her um and who blossoms but her, her mantra in Greek, because she's a Greek immigrant, she's like, a, a life lived in fear is a life half lived. Hmm. I just remember watching, first of all, loving this movie to death and hearing that and kind of being knocked back in my seat around it. I'm like, that is it. A life lived in fear is a life half lived. And so in some ways, it's a, how do you be fearless about the life that you're living? Hmm. Um, hmm. And how do you 
because I think if you have a fearlessness, which doesn't mean you're not scared and doesn't mean you're not worried and doesn't mean you don't have moments where you're like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> yes. Where am I and who am I trying to become? You have all of that. But to just to go, look, I'm going to try and be fearless around how I, how I live this life, do the things that scare me a bit, just mm. feels like that's how you get the best version of yourself coming forward. And I love that you named right at the start of this conversation the emotional heart of the book which is we unlock our greatness by working on the hard things and yeah i think it's all kind of entangled in that and the fact you share your own story and the story of a couple of the people you coach and obviously i've i watched the videos that you you can access to get the book um it's a deliberate process but it's one where you know you cover all the different angles <laughs> you talk about obviously the worthy goal coming up with the worthy goal committing and then crossing the threshold yeah. all are important and this is a bit of a well, it's a question. I'm not sure it's the best question of mine, but all of that's hard. But in all of the work you've done with individuals, and I know you've tested this extensively uh, yeah. with teams, which is the which of the three is the hardest one? Um, I think the one that gets skipped over most often and has the most depth to it is the middle one, which is around the commitment stage. Hmm. Because it's one thing to name a worthy goal. And... But I do think if you if you start that and you go through a process of drafting and redrafting it, you're going to end up with something that will feel pretty good for you. Mm. And I think once you cross the threshold, you know, the insights around that are don't travel alone and take small steps and yes. make sure you can come back to the best version of yourself. So all of that is relatively straightforward once you see it. But I think we we um, let ourselves down. And I've certainly let myself down plenty of times where I've tried to name a worthy goal, something I want to take on. And then I just somehow don't do it. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on with this? Yeah. And, you know, this really has, David, a nod back to the, the work of Ron Heifetz in, mm. in Harvard and technical and adaptive change. And then Bob Keegan and Lisa Leahy and immunity to change where, where they ask these questions, right? Why is some change easier than other change. Hmm. The assumption I have is that for most people, when they set a worthy goal, they're talking about hard change, not easy change. Yes. Yes. And I think to, to understand whether you're really committed to this, you have to understand the price being paid. Hmm. Um, what's the hmm. price? What, what gets disrupted by you taking this on? Because if you take on a worthy goal, you disrupt expectations of yourself. You disrupt others' expectations of you. You're investing some form of resource, whether that's time and or money and or mm. relationship equity. There's stuff on the line for a goal that you don't know whether it will work or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not sure how this actually plays out. And we don't name the resistance. We don't look at the resistance. And we don't acknowledge that the status quo just has a stronger grip on us than we realize. It's interesting so, when you say that. When you say that, the you know, the sort of looking at the status quo, the you know the, the prize, the prizes, and so on. My first reaction was, "Oh, that sounds pretty straightforward." And then you actually do it, right. and I did it. So I'll give you a glimpse. You know, one of the things I'm considering is, that is a book, and it's not about the book; it's about the the impact I want to have. Sure. And then all of the things that get in the way, like <laughs> I've never written a book. I've written lots of articles. I think I'm yeah. really good in this space in the world. And then it's like, right. what if people hate it, et cetera, et cetera. It right. gets very specific and very um, in your inner core, gets to your inner yeah. core quite quickly. And that's the hard work, right? The actual listing, the documenting and right. the right. movement. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're like, so I'm David. I've got a reputation for having good articles, a reputation for having a great podcast, a reputation for showing up in this way in the world. Yeah. If I show up as a book, I have to give myself 12 months to write a book. I have to see whether I can move from 500 words to 25,000 words or 50,000 words. Hmm. I've got to understand how to market books in a way that you don't market articles. There's just a whole bunch of stuff that if you sit there and poke at it, it makes you go, is it worth it? Because yeah. that's the question, which is like, is it worth it? And then you weigh that against going, okay, but you, you're seeing what's at risk. You're seeing how this will challenge and provoke and disrupt. What If, if you get a book out there, what happens? What, what's, what are the prizes? You're like, yeah. okay, so I, I influence more people. I put out a coherent body of work. I potentially build a reputation. 
maybe some people actually buy my book like the bonus you know, trying to sell yeah. books hard um and it, you're weighing that up and you're looking at that and that's where just a, a more nuanced understanding of whether you're up for this or not can come forth and the fact that you call out the three elements of a worthy goal sort of moves you past this oh, I'm not sure I've got one, or is this good enough? You're actually being specific about the criteria and then listing them. But let me, let me, let me skip on just for a moment. Yeah, on. Yeah. There's a lot of, I guess, external stimuli that helps along the way. You know, you talked about the band of people who can you know, challenge you, support you, yeah. um, and give you love and attention. There's a lot of inner work as well. And I, I wanted to hear a bit more about, because I know that's a topic you, you care deeply yeah. about, but where that plays a role it, to complement and I guess process the stimuli that you get through the process. Yeah. Look, I think um, we, so I'm in my, someone said, I'm in, I'm in my early mid fifties. So I know 53 <laughs> or 54, somewhere you just sort of lose track a little bit when you hit your fifties. I'm like, I don't know. I'm less than 55. I'm more than 50. And um, there's just a, there's just a way that you can settle at this age, you know, and there's a reason that there are these moments in people's lives, whether it's in your twenties or in your 35, that's a classic time uh, or uh, in your fifties where you're kind of like, you know what? I'm good. I'm going to settle. Yes. And um, I just find people more interesting when they haven't settled, when they're still mm. learning, when they're still trying to find the edge to themselves, where there's mm. still a vivacity. And, I don't think that really happens accidentally. I think you've got to kind of name that. Yeah. And then it's really helpful for you to build the systems around you and the environment that you want to encourage that and stimulate you and provoke you. Hmm. But it's this back and forth between what's the external, you know, the, the metaphor of the rider and the elephant on the path in terms of a way of talking about behavior change and the rider is the rational case for it and the elephant is the emotional case for it. Uh, but and the track is the environment, and we always put the focus on the rider. Yes. But it's actually the environment that that shapes the way we behave. So you're like, yes. you need to shape your environment so you behave the way you want to behave. Hmm. But you've also got to you've got to figure out what your fire is and how to stoke it. Hmm. Hmm. On that point, and, and linking to the, your your own human needs that you call out around sort of creativity and freedom, I'm sort of struck with a. I don't think it's a trade off. I think it's a paradox um, around you know this expressive aspect to you and indeed many of us yeah. and at the same time the approach is highly structured when you follow yeah. it not if you follow yeah. it how did you how did you balance the two how did you combine the two given the tensions well, i guess yeah you know my my very first job was in the world of innovation and creativity <laughs> and in the book i actually tell some stories of all the bad things i've invented that haven't worked very well yeah, yeah. um so you know you can look at those first five or six years of my career as a mixed bag which is like you know i learned a lot and i was given a degree of freedom that was was less common um we just weren't very successful at actually inventing anything that went on to be a success hmm. but it became clear in learning about how creativity works it works well with parameters yes so um you set hmm. the parameters you build a process and then you allow yourself to play freely within that process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a structureless conversation around this is like, so tell me, what are your dreams? And that's, that's, that's an overwhelming question. It's too big. It's too mm. amorphous. It's yes, kind of yes. yeah, arms around that. But if I'm like, you know, as a teacher, because fundamentally what I am in the end is a teacher. That's, you know, whether you, you want to put a, an author or a facilitator or a coach label on me at the heart of all of these is a pedagogy and a, 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 a hunger to help people learn um you you've got to create structures that allow people autonomy and choice yes. um but also move people along so you give them the best chance of making progress so it, it's a tension for sure it's interesting that point where there's a lot of um, uh, emphasis at the moment on, on leadership around greater distributed, you know, responsibility, greater empowerment. Yeah. And I think it gets confused with as a free for all, which it's not. There are parameters set and there's encouragement and empowerment, but it comes with accountability. It's the same, same. Well, exactly. And yeah. I think it's very interesting in organizational life to have as a goal, 
you know, um, I love the work of Aaron Dignan and Brave New Work and his idea around the most interesting forms of organizations are complexity centered and human centered. Mm. It just acknowledges the messiness and the unpredictableness and the systemsness of organizations, but it also keeps insisting that we put people back in the center of it. And part of that is an acknowledgement that, um, uh, you know, it's worthwhile raising a dubious eye at round hierarchy and how hierarchy exists, mm. but also the opposite of hierarchy isn't just free form dancing. <laughs> it's, yes. yeah. it's how do we find the right way for accountability and responsibility to sit at the right place in our organization with the right person? How do we have yeah. an adult to adult relationship with that other yeah. person? And that's, that's hard, but it's very interesting. And you talk about systems and organizations there. I mean, for me, I read your, and you began to use your book in the context of both the personal questions I've faced and organizations. And I guess my hope, my humble hope will be it's used for both um, because it definitely plays a, could play a role. Um, even though immediately the stories are personal, yeah, the process and the depth, um, I think can definitely play a role for organizational and uh, yeah, ask so, a question, you know, what are yeah. the worthy goals of your organization? Why, yeah. why do you matter? What do you stand for? Who do you, what, what impact do you want to have? Well, it's interesting to think about how, how it will scale. Like, I, it, I think it really scales, first of all, at an individual level. Like, if you lead a team, it's really interesting to go, do I know what the worthy goals are of the people on my team? So that they're yeah. thrilling. It's like lighting them up. It's important, meaning it serves the team and the unit and the, the business's strategic goals in some way. And it's daunting. So we learn. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably interesting to say, well, as a team, what's our, what's our worthy goal? You know, how do we yeah. find a goal that unites us so that we grow as a team, we have impact as a team, um, we individually contribute so that we're more than the sum of our parts as a team? Hmm. And I think that's a much more interesting conversation than smart goals or OKRs, which are about, in my mind, pinning stuff down. <laughs> yeah, they can Hiding become very transactional, official even yeah. though you can have a good quality conversation actually whether people are up for it whether they believe in it sometimes yeah. doesn't happen um yeah but like one of the things that I'm, sorry, i'm please. just gonna say i'm not i'm not totally sure a worthy goal scales at an organizational level i mean i think you want to have conversations about do we have the three or four right strategic foci focuses yeah but um it becomes tr it, you can certainly talk about important and daunting in yes. that context thrilling becomes a bit amorphous which is like hey, yeah is this you can make the connection it's like how does this play to our strengths as an organization how does this speak to our values as an organization it just it just is a bit more of a leap i agree but one of the tests i have when i do strategy work is you know does does the leadership team and that's not just the top team do they feel a degree of high degree of excitement and right. much substantial uncertainty otherwise just it's just refining the the status yeah. quo it's just and thrilling important and daunting is meant to quicken people's pulse a little bit yeah in a yeah, way yeah. that BHAG doesn't <laughs> yes yes i mean one of the things you do throughout the book is uh, if you like portray contrasts and one of the lovely contrasts are like, this not that to sort of mm. the difference between you who you, who you are and what you know who you are now and who you yeah. want to become and i would love to hear more about either whether you or one of your stories you know what was the hardest shift that you had to make from the now yeah. to the version of your of the person you're becoming well you know it it it, it changes as i as i as i face into things and i move through my life you know one of the stories in the book which i'll just touch on is what it means for me to stop being something so stop being the ceo stop being the mm. the person whose dna is woven into box of crayons the company i started yes but to kind of move the story on you know, it's 2022 when we're having this conversation. My goal this year in the 11 months left is to write three books. Now, that's a lot of book. <laughs> no, <they're gonna> <laughs> short books. Um, but I'm like, I think I could, I've got three different interesting books that I, I've, I've chewed over the ideas and I think there's something substantial there and I understand how they fit the bigger body of work that I'm looking to do. But, you know, the interesting thing for me, David, is to sit and go, so what is, what does it mean for me to claim that I'm a writer? 
because I've never claimed to be a writer before. I've I've written books, but mm. never as a that's my identity. I'm a writer. It's more I'm writing this book on the edge of a business that I'm running because I can see how it contributes to a business and yes. it's a way of creating and putting IP out into the world. Not I'm a writer. Mm. So you know one of the things that I'm sitting with at the moment in this kind of protean change of mm. evolution is if I am, if I say yes to being claiming the identity of a writer for the next year, what must I say no to? Mm. And that's pretty interesting because it means I actually have to say no to a bunch of work. I have to say no to a certain amount of profile because I need to be in a cave writing. I need to say no to a <laughs> bunch of things. And I'm trying to, I'm wrestling with that at the moment because I, I, I love the question you know, which comes from the coaching habit. If you're saying yes to this, what must you say no to? Hmm. And I love it in part because it's something I wrestle with all the time. Because I'm a I'm a yes oriented guy. Yes, yes, I can see that. I can sense that. I mean, you you talk about people to help you along the way, whether it's in that yeah. decision making process or more generally the famous five, um, yeah. which is not a reference to the book, but uh, famous five in group of individuals that takes. So who doesn't back. love a good Enid Blyton story? There you go. <laughs> if we're allowed to talk about that these days, but that's a different topic. Um, understandably, you know, you have to leave people behind. You don't refer to that in the book. I'm just, you know, I get that. I get that why. Yeah. But um, how hard has it been to leave people behind? I, they're, they're not the people who are central to whatever it is, your new venture, the new podcast, your new Yeah, books. yeah. It's, um, I, I would say it's been mixed. Um, the good news in some ways is I have a very forward orientation. Um, so it means that I am less sentimental than other people um, mm. around relationships and the like. There's a price I pay for that, <laughs> which is having fewer relationships that are, 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 are based like that. Mm. Um, there are some people who I'd say I can look at the three buckets. There are some people who I go, we we work together and we complete it in a way that feels healthy and natural and our departure was a mutually graceful event. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of people for whom things just kind of, we just drifted apart. It wasn't a graceful ending. It was just a, uh, where, where do they go? <laughs> and they're probably asking the same of me. Mm. And I've got stories of people for whom the departure was not a successful or graceful thing at all. And, and there was a sense of anger and betrayal and frustration and sadness, probably on both sides of the equation. Mm. So, um, but I, I think it's a really interesting question to ask yourself, which is like, so what, if I'm, if I'm purpose driven, if I'm really committed to try and get this thing done, what's the price this is coming back to the commitments thing which is what's the yes. price that gets paid here and sometimes it's going you know what you're not the right person from this role and this part of my life right now mm -hmm. um and are you willing to have that conversation or are you like i'll oh, say i'll be nice <laughs> and i'll keep that going and i get to sacrifice the book that i'm writing or whatever it might be mm -hmm. so it's 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 the hardest thing in some ways which is like mm -hmm. wrestling with the messiness of, of a human relationship yeah, that's a beautiful way to put a difficult topic and a delicate topic that often goes unsaid, yeah. especially I wish in certain you had cultures. to do it better, more consistently well. Yeah, um, but he I'm says working he, on it. He says, as a Brit, you somewhat <laughs> alleged as a we don't talk about these things, but I'm not sure well, that's exactly. True. I lived in England for plenty of time, and my dad's English, so I've got, I, I've got I know. I've inherited some of that. But let's 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 conclude the conversation with something more positive. So, imagine you're talking with somebody who has an itch to do something. Yeah. Good. Whether it's worthy yet, um, they want it. They had perhaps have some full starts, but they got the right intention, and they have a degree of urgency. Whether that's a light event causing it, whether it's just an yeah. itch that they've been <laughs> scratching for a while. Apart from well, clearly buy the book and use it, what would you? Uh, <laughs> what would you? That's too easy an answer. What would you say to them? Well, I would say perhaps two things. One is try writing it down because it becomes interesting when you write it down and it moves out of your head where it kind of bumps around in a slightly amorphous way. Yeah. And then once you've written it down, realize that what you've got is a great start, but it's your first draft. It's not the final draft. So work it. Yeah. And obviously the book offers some kind of 
processes around how you might work it and strengthen it and tidy it up, but you don't need the book. You can just, just permission to say, do three drafts of a goal before you commit to a goal is itself a, a useful way of thinking about it. What I love throughout the book is not only the, the research that you refer to that gives it depth and substance, but some of the process I've seen aspects of before, the way you could bring it together beautifully and you iterate and you illustrate it and you bring some humor and you go back from <laughs> centuries back, examples from centuries behind to something I would love to have been in a uh, fly on the wall as you wrote some of this in your cave. Can you get flies <laughs> in cave? In, in your cave to, to write yeah. it. But hey, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure, privilege spending time with you. David. Where can people find out more about obviously the book and you? Yeah, thank you. So if you want to go straight to the book, howtobegin.com is there. And if you want a little more about just me, my website is mbs.works. Wonderful. Wonderful. David, thank you. You're a, you're a very gracious host. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time. So that was another edition of Lance Food on the Line. If you did enjoy it, please give us a great rating, sign up to the podcast and to the YouTube channel and check out the other interviews in the series. Thanks for your time. And thanks again, Michael.